good evening uh, welcome to this uh, public lecture by another eminent uh, personality shri prabha shri devan uh, on judiciary and change uh, in the chair we have professor lalita sundareshan who is a who is a faculty of nias Prof just a few lines about professor, professor lalita sundareshan professor lalita sundareshan uh, did her work on digital processing of multi satellite data which was a phd work she was a scientist at, at isro where she carried out studies to evaluate the usefulness of satellite remote sensing for monitoring natural resources and natural disasters with, with special reference to india she also has worked as a principal scientific officer at the department of science and technology where she was involved with the setting up of natural resource database centers in the districts of karnataka together with iit bombay she was also involved in the development of indigenous geographical information software that is gis software and uh, she has also taught both mathematics and statistics both at the secondary and at the university level uh, can i request uh, professor lalita sundareshan to kindly chair the session and introduce this speaker thank you good evening uh, it's i'm very much honored to be here to introduce a very um, distinguished person in fact it makes me very nervous um particularly when you have somebody like justice prabha sri devan my association with lawyers and judges has been almost nil and i'm i've been always uh, uh, you know you try to keep off from lawyers and judges in your personal life you don't want to do have anything to do with them uh, but today i am extremely honored to introduce a speaker and i look forward to her talk and just to say a few words i'm sure everybody knows her but let me uh, complete the formalities uh, justice prabha sri devan was judge of the madras high court from march 2000 to august 2010 she was chairperson intellectual property appellate board from may 2011 to august 2013 and she was also chairperson think tank to frame india's ipr policy in 2014 and i believe a draft policy has already been made justice sri devan was named as one of the 50 most important persons in the ip world by managing intellectual property in 2012 2013 and again in 2015 She was also awarded the Justice Shivraj V Patil Award for service to humanity. Her many landmark judgments as High Court judge occurred in cases dealing with child rights, illegal executive detention orders, gender equality, disability rights, mental health, protection of water bodies and environment, rights of the depressed classes, regulation of mining and sand quarrying. right to education right to information protection of heritage buildings and worth of the homemakers work she was on the bench which decided the novartis challenge to the constitu constitutionality of s3d of the patents act her judgments as chairperson ipab include the yahoo business method patents bayer versus natco sankal rehabilitation trust case Enercon patents and trademarks like Financial Times, Talai Pa Kattu Biryani, Officers Choice, and Red Label. The last part is the most interesting. She is also well known for her literary pursuits and writes for newspapers, both in English and in Tamil. And I, I, I believe very recently she has translated the works of. Um, Our Chuda Mani from Tamil to English. I really look forward to reading it. I didn't know this till very recently. So let me request uh, Justice Sri Devan to deliver her talk. Good evening, everyone. It's really an honor to be here in this lovely campus on the thirtieth year, isn't it? Uh, and the subject. is to lead a change the chairman person dr lalita sundareshan said that she was nervous i am equally nervous but let's begin what i want to say to live 
is to change, and to change is to live. Without change, we merely exist. And this is true of persons and institutions. In the book, Choose Life, which is a dialogue between Arnold Toynbee and Daisaku Ikeda, who founded uh, the Soka Gakkai group of Buddhism, Toynbee says that change and novelty are data of human experience. How do we measure change? We measure it by time and by space too. In fact, in that book, the two men speak of the spatio-temporal frame of life's flows and wonder if time and space are not merely limitations of the human mind's comprehending ability. We are agents of change within us and without us. I thought it would be interesting to see how the judiciary has worked change in the framework of time and space. The Constitution begins with the sonorous words, we the people of India gave to ourselves the Constitution. But it is the judiciary which constantly tests whether the state action conforms with the Constitution. And the Constitution itself has inbuilt devices which make change uh, that without which factor. Article 38 is the conscience of the Constitution, says Justice Krishna here. Article 38 reads as follows. The state shall strive to promote the welfare of the people by securing and protecting as effectively as it may a social order in which justice, social, economic, and political shall inform all the institutions of national life. This social order is then the goal to be attained, and every change should ideally push us towards this goal. Granville Austin, exploring the Indian Constitution, says that the directive principles contained in the Constitution have a clearer statement of a social revolution. The social order, when infused with in, in, with equality is secured for those who were denied it and spreads where it did not exist before. To use his words, it was hoped this revolution would bring about fundamental changes in the structure of Indian society, a society with a long and glorious cultural tradition, but greatly in need of a powerful infusion of energy and nationalism. These fundamental changes were expected to make the preamble's promises real. That is, what did not exist would come into being, and where it did not exist, it would reach. This meant that the foundational principles of justice, equality, liberty, and fraternity would remain the same. But the structure, unlike physical structures, would change with the times. Judges decide according to the law of the land. When we become judges, we take an oath that we shall discharge our duty without fear or favor, affection or ill will, and that we will uphold the constitution and the laws. Then, all judges, if they thought alike, judgments would be assembly line products. But that does not happen. Why? Because human nature is not monochromatic. We have different shades, and that brings differences. We have different backgrounds, different life experiences, different expectations. Philip Hamburger speaks of the conundrum of private judicial knowledge, which also influenced the decisions. The judge's philosophy and ideology also work on the way she decides. According to Posner, Kelsen's concept of law allows the space for bringing ideology and social science into the judgments. When I was what is called a sitting judge and grappling with the law, I used to dip into a book called Judicial Discretion, written by Justice Aharon Barak of the Supreme Court of Israel. Even now, when I'm no longer sitting and no longer grappling cases, I go to that book because it somehow brings me alive. He says that a judge must know his country, 
and its variety and its problems. These are his words. He says the judge is a part of its people. At times he is in an ivory tower, but this tower is in the hills of Jerusalem and not in the Greek Olympus. A judge is a citizen and a good judge must be a good citizen. He must do his share in the building of society. Pragmatists also insist that political and judicial systems are relative to national culture. So a judges is rooted in the reality of her country. She cannot just go berserk in an abstract space. Her holy book is the constitution and she must stay true to it. The constitution has a higher authority and commands a stricter adherence than other laws. And it is the tool by which the promise of justice, equality, liberty and fraternity is made the law of the land. Philip Hamburger in his book Law and Judicial Duty says, a constitution adopted by the people was the fundamental part of the law of the land. But what if the people had not adopted the constitution? This is so true. If all of us who were alive on the date when the constitution came into being and the generations that came thereafter arranged our conduct in line with the constitution, we'll be an ideal country. We did not do, a, do that and we are not an ideal country. The judiciary, however, is vested with the power to nudge the people towards that ideal. Nehru said, change is essential, but continuity is also necessary. This applies to the rule of law, which keeps continuity and also radicalizes the system. When the constitution was framed, people asked Dr. Ambedkar, there is really nothing new in the constitution. Then he said that the scope of what a constitution should be has long been settled and all constitutions are basically similar. The provisions are similar. But he said something about our constitution that relates to change. He said, the distinguishing feature is that it is a flexible federation and I feel that the constitution is workable, it is flexible, and it is strong enough to hold the country together, both in peacetime and in wartime. These are Dr. Ambedkar's words. Judiciary works these flexibilities to make the change. It changes us and our social, political, and economic character. In every legal system, we have certain cases which you may call the on-the-course cases. It is the usual cases. They provide the certainty and the continuity. But there are the tough ones. These call for a churning of ideas, a slowing of skin. These cases challenge the status quo and move us from the comfort zone. Status quo is comfort from a short-term perspective. But as a long-term goal, it is stagnation. Therefore, we, we do avoid status quo. We do not remain the same and we change. Posner says that insulation and the marvelous mystery of time give courts the capacity to appeal to man's better nature, to call forth their aspirations which may have been forgotten in the moments hue and cry. This is called the opportunity for sober second thought. According to him, the masses are intermittently whipped up by demagogues or by their own ignorant and exaggerated fears to support foolish, even barbarous public measures. Judicial resistance to these creates a cooling off period. It gives the people a time to pause. If the people's passions do not cool even thereafter, then the law takes its course. But the courts create an opportunity for sober second thought. Death penalty debates criminalization of homosexuality, criminalization of attempts to commit suicide are examples of issues where people are strongly polarized. Everyone has a view and everyone thinks their view is right. They are easy to understand on a gut level, but slightly difficult on a cerebral level. I write in Tamil, it's an irregular column, when I discussed the legality of death penalty 
and the issue of homosexuality. The responses were, what will you do if your daughter is raped and murdered? Or, these are all Western notions not applicable to us. That is the level of issue-based debates very often amongst us. It's not about my daughter, or, nor is it about the supposedly inferior Western notions. Death penalty debate is about the constitutionality of an irreversible state action which is fraught with human errors. That is the thing that one faces when one looks at death penalty as an issue. And the gay rights is about constitutional tenets of inclusiveness, dignity, and non-discrimination. I will look at some judgments to see how the course of jurisprudence has changed. The gay rights judgment is an interesting study of the time, space, vaults. It is also a good case to start my sharing. In that case, the Delhi High Court held that when society displays inclusiveness and understanding, every person is assured of a life of dignity and non-discrimination. This was the spirit behind the resolution of which Nehru spoke so passionately. They said that Indian constitutional law does not permit statutory criminal law to be held captive by the popular conceptions or misconceptions of the LGBTs. They said discrimination is the antithesis of equality and recognition of equality will alone foster the dignity of every individual. It applied the constitutional morality test and then it decriminalized homosexuality in certain conditions. It quoted Dr. Ambedkar, constitutional morality, he said, is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. He said, our people still have to realize it. He said, democracy in India is only a top dressing on the Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic. The Delhi High Court was actually trying to give a breathing space for all of us who thought that homosexuality must be punished. It was trying to lead the way to a space where this unreasonable phobia will disappear after the passage of time. The state accepted the judgment. Many appeared as interveners. But the persons who went before the Supreme Court and the appellants first named were not parties before the Delhi High Court but they felt they had a moral responsibility to attack the Delhi High Court judgment and, and to uphold the cultural values of Indian society. The Supreme Court reversed the High Court judgment. The Supreme Court said, this affects really a very minuscule portion of the population, so it really does not matter. And then it also said that merely because uh, there may be police excesses against the homosexual people, that does not mean that uh, the Indian Penal Code, as it stood, is unconstitutional. Then they said, the lawmakers are free to uh, delete the section. Then came the transgender judgment. In the transgender judgment, the Supreme Court referred to the Yogyakarta principles which deal with human rights standards applicable when issues of sexual orientation and gender identity arise. These principles say clearly that states must repeal criminal and other legal provisions that prohibit or are in, in effect employed to prohibit consensual sexual activity among people of the same sex who are over the age of consent and ensure that an equal age of consent applies to both same sex and different sexual activity. And adopt appropriate le legislative measures to prohibit and eliminate discrimination. Supreme Court concluded that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, which um, re results in discrimination or restriction or preference, actually results in nullifying or transposing equality by the law. Then they gave various directions. At the time, one of the counsel 
stood up and asked, what about the gay rights judgment? The gay rights judgment was given by two judges and this transgender judgment was also given by two judges. So they said, we are not going to talk about that. But in that silence, embedded in the transgender judgment, you can almost hear the one, two, three, one, two, three walls of time and space change, where there is an apotheosis of inc inclusion and non-discrimination to any group of people. After the dance analogy, I will choose music, a hangover of the Madras season. The concept of public trust regarding the disposal and dis distribution of natural resources was developed like a musical crescendo by the Supreme Court from the lower octave to the higher octave. Our constitution refers to distribution of material resources as a directive principle. Directive principles are not justiciable, like fundamental rights are. So directive principles are only aspirations. As we originally understood it, they were aspirations of the people. But this changed over the years. In 1999, the Supreme Court in M.C. Mehta versus Kamal Nath held that the public trust doctrine is a part of the law of the land. So what started off as an aspiration of the state became the law. This doctrine states that natural resources like air, water and forests are so important to all that the state holds it as a trustee and is enjoined to protect them for the general public rather than restrict their use to a limited ownership. Arguing against a management approach which seeks to balance the tripartite values inherent in sustainable development, the professor of University of Otago, New Zealand, Seri Warnock says, the environmental costs are distant, difficult to measure, and on a balance between tangible economic benefits and tangible social benefits against intangible, misunderstood environmental benefits, the tangible wins every time, since there is an inherent bias towards development. In one of the cases where, which I heard, where there was rampant sand removal from a river in one of the districts of our state, I requested an environmental expert, a professor, to give to give me a report on how this removal of sand works. And he said that if you removed so much sand today, it takes, I think, five to 10 years for nature to, to restore it. And it was a sad, it was a sad story because we are, we are actually embarking on something irreversible without without calculating the damage that will be inflicted on us and our future generation in the name of development. This public trust doctrine helps in straightening that bias. Then came the 2G case. Of course, all of us know the 2G case, where the Supreme Court considered its own earlier decisions and said, the state is the legal owner of natural resources. It is a trustee of the people, and it is empowered to distribute the same. The process of distribution must be guided by constitutional principles. The Supreme Court in 2G said, auction is the method by which the natural resources may be distributed. Then there was a special reference to the president to consider this issue, whether auction was indeed the only method. And then the Supreme Court said, though auction is a good method, it cannot be elevated to a constitutional status. It said alienation of natural resources is a policy decision, and the means adopted for the same are thus executive prerogative. But then they said something that is really a big change. They said, this is an aspect of the doctrine of equality. 
It's a constitution. Article 14 is the doc, is, uh, speaks about equality. This says, this is actually an aspect of Article 14. It said, rather than prescribing or proscribing a method, we believe a judicial scrutiny of methods of disposal should depend on the facts and circumstances of each case, failing which the court, in exercise of the power of judicial review, shall term the executive action as arbitrary, unfair, unreasonable, and capricious. Therefore, now, usage and distribution of material resources is seen under the skin of Article 39B, which speaks of distribution of material resources, and 38, which is a promise to serve, secure the social order for the welfare of the people. These two principles can be fulfilled only if society changes to meet the socio-economic goal. So the space of fundamental right of equality has now expanded to include even the distribution of natural resources, though at the time when the constitution was enacted, it was seen only as a directive principle which was not justiciable. Fundamental rights, now what are they? They were originally understood as separate rights which enabled individuals to claim limited protection against the state. This has changed. There was a case called the I.R. Coelho case. In that case, the Supreme Court said, the jurisprudence and development around fundamental rights has made it clear that they are not limited narrow rights but provide a broad check against the violation or excesses by the state authority. So the transition from a set of independent narrow rights to broad checks on state power was enunciated by Supreme Court in various decisions over the years. This does not mean the constitution has changed. It only means how we look at those words in the Constitution changes. It expands so that the Constitution's promise is fulfilled. Lawrence Tribe says, Constitution is an evolving repository of nation's core political ideals and a record of the nation's deepest ideological battles. What was I.R. Coelho's case about? One of the strongest protection that a citizen has is the right to approach the court for judicial review. In fact, Dr. Ambedkar calls it the, the one protection, the strong protection in the Constitution. Now, the genesis of this case started almost from 1951 with the First Amendment. Certain zamindars approached the Supreme Court saying that these land reform laws that were brought about were actually impinging upon their individual rights of property. Then the parliament felt that the validity of agrarian reforms had formed the subject matter of dilatory litigation, and it is necessary to secure laws from attack by landowners. The constitution was amended by adding 31A and 31B. The latter was not part of the original constitution. By the same amendment, what we did was we added the ninth schedule. The ninth schedule is a kind of an umbrella. Any act that is included in the ninth schedule, you cannot challenge it. It, it goes beyond the purview of attack. And at that time, 13 legislations were included in the ninth schedule. Then the question was raised, can the parliament amend the constitution? We went on an it can, it can't path. Then finally we came to what almost all of you would have heard, the Keshavananda Bharati case. In that Keshavananda Bharati case, the Supreme Court propounded the basic theory, basic structure theory, they say in this something which relates to change about the makers of the constitution. They say, I quote, they were not oblivious of the phenomenon writ large in human history that change without continuity can be anarchy, change with continuity can mean progress, 
Continuity without change can mean no progress. The Supreme Court held that the Parliament had the amending power, but it did not extend to altering the basic structure of our Constitution. The basic structure theory is now here to stay. It has been affirmed again and again. It provided the continuity as it provided the basic identity of our Constitution. And what are the rights that are part of the basic structure? Are they new rights? The Supreme Court said, no, the Constitution did not give you new rights. Those rights were already there. It confirmed its existence and gave them protection. During the emergency, several items unconnected to land reforms were included in the Ninth Schedule. Then they were deleted. Then the question arose, what would happen if a very powerful parliament made laws which went against the basic structure and protected them with the Ninth Schedule? To immunize certain laws from the check of judicial review may result in the change of the Constitution, bringing incompatibility not only with the doctrine of basic structure, but also with the very existence of limited power of amending the Constitution. The judgment in I.R. Coelho asks, what if an anti-secular law is included in the Ninth Schedule? Because secularism is part of the basic structure, and if we say anything that goes into the ninth schedule is proof, of attack proof, then what happens? The Supreme Court felt that the consequence of such ninth schedule inclusion means an unlimited power to totally nullify that part of the Constitution which deals with fundamental rights. According to them, Article 14, equality, or Article 19 of freedom of speech and expression, 21 life, stand between the heaven of freedom that Tagore dreams of and the nightmare of unbridled power. I.R. Coelho case said that all amendments made after 1973, that is the Keshavan and the Bharati case here, when the basic structure theory was propounded, had to pass the basic structure test under judicial review. The Supreme Court said, our constitution will almost certainly continue to be amended as India grows and changes. However, a democratic India will not grow out of the need for protecting the principles behind our fundamental rights. They said that the framers of the constitution has built a wall and that is the basic structure wall. The question you may ask is, if the wall was always there, contemporaneous with the Constitution. Why did the Supreme Court fix a subsequent time marker for judicial review test? Or is it a space marker? In physics, they say that space-time is a model that weaves space and time in a continuum. So it would seem with the change in the judicial space. The Parliament perceived the challenges made by the Zamindars as hurdle to the social order goal and created a fence beyond which judicial review will not trespass. Now, after decades that that fence has been removed, courts will go there and check out if the law passes the basic structure test. This is somewhat like the knight's move on the chessboard, straight and then one angle. We can also have a space-time model for this jurisprudence relating to Hindu women's right to property. Recognition of the right to property is the most visible indicator of women's empowerment. At the Conference of International Association of Women Judges at Dublin in 2002, the keynote address speaker said, insignificant is the power of innovation of any judge when compared with the bulk and pressure of the rules that hedge him on every side. Innovate, however, to some extent he must, for with new conditions, there must be new rules. All that the method of sociology demands is that within this narrow range of choice, he shall search for justice. It is whether we, we, we use the car or the bullock cart, the goal is the same. So how we move? The truth is, the woman faces many hurdles by the time she gets what she claims, if at all she does. 
when the woman separates from her spouse or is deserted by her husband, she has to go to the court to get maintenance. The property, movable or immovable, does not fall on her lap. I'm not saying that all judges dismiss petitions filed by women. All I'm saying is that it is an ordeal for the woman to go to court. And judges must remember that. Women are not equally positioned in the political, economic, and social space. So what they want is substantive equality. If someone asks, like Shylock, is that the law? We have to answer like Portia did, thy shall sell thee the act, and the act is the constitution, which promised to women equality. There can be no doubt that this aspect of women empowerment weighed with the people who debated when the constitution was made. The Hindu Succession Act was seen as the most crucial of reforms. The original draft, which attempted to do away with the concept of co-personary property, was vehemently resisted. A person from Madhya Bharat, Sita Ram Jaju, he said, here we feel the pinch because it touches our pockets. We, the male members of this house, are in a huge majority. I do not wish that the tyranny of the majority may be imposed on the minority, the female members of this house. But unfortunately, co-personary property remained. But there were changes. Under the old Hindu law, women had limited rights only. This change was a time change, you may say. Wife and mother got a share in the Hindu male's property, but the law was still not willing to extend her right over the entire space. The Hindu Succession Act says that if a woman at the time when the act came into being was possessed of a property, that would not be a limited right. That would blossom into a full right. That is the word that they use. Now, when a case known as the Tulsamas case went before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, this word possessed must be given the widest amplitude. It must not be actual physical possession. It can even be deemed possession because only then this right which we intended to give to the women will become real. In this case, Justice Bhagavati gave a separate judgment where he explained how the judiciary facilitates change. He said the act was a classic case of unhappy draftsmanship, which was counterproductive of the result it ended to achieve. So this was a case where the parliament had brought in a change which never materialized until judiciary clarified how the change should be affected. This was in 1977. That decade was the golden period when Supreme Court expanded the articles of life, liberty, and equality and fitted them into the space of socio-economic rights. Now let us forward, fast forward to 2009 and come to the case of Narayani Devi. Narayani Devi married Vandin Dayal Sharma in 1955. He died within three months. She was sent out of her matrimonial home. She lived with her parents, earned a living, and died in 1966. Her mother was alive. She wrote no will. We normally don't believe in writing wills. Her mother claimed, applied for a succession certificate to access all the deposits in the bank. Her Narayani Devi's sister-in-law's son also applied. Sister-in-law means the husband's sister. The Supreme Court held against the mother. The Supreme Court said, when a woman dies intestate, if she has a child and husband, then there is no question, it goes to them. But if not, the father's heirs 
will get only that property which had inherited from the father all the others will go to the husband's heirs she lived with her parents she was driven out from the husband's house there she studied she equipped herself and went to work and earned the money supreme court which in 1977 said we must give the widest amplitude to possessed dragged its feet in 2009 they said it is a hard case it is now a well settled principle in law that sentiment or sympathy alone would not be a guiding factor in determining the rights of the parties which are otherwise clear and unambiguous the mother's claim was not based on sympathy or sentiment it was based on logic principles of fairness equity and justice but supreme court found that the law was a hurdle to her claim if the word possessed could be given the widest amplitude in 1977 surely gender equality did, demanded that the property earned while in her father's home shall go to the father's heirs evidently the supreme court of 2009 did not think so it did not think it was time to remove the crease in the statute this was clumsy or inept draftsmanship too or probably in 1956 people did not think that women would earn and leave behind an estate it was supreme court which had to breathe life into that change in circumstances but the daring leaps of faith that came about in the 70s and 80s were now fewer here i am reminded of i don't know my grandson plays with one thing called bay blade bay blade is what we used to call top when when in, when i was young and this, the curious thing about the bay blade is it it wobbles and i think it's going to stop but somehow it gathers momentum and it's, and it spins some more so my fervent hope is this wobble will straighten itself and women's equality will sp- spin as it ought to spin towards greater empowerment then i'm coming to the close i'm going to deal with two judgments of the madras high court these were all supreme court judgments these two judgments where i had a role to play the first is the homemaker judgment a child lost both her parents in an accident and claimed compensation for both the deaths the motor accident tribunal gave an award the insurance company appealed against that award saying that this was too much compensation they also said that the mother being i mean there is no proof that she worked outside her home being a homemaker what was given as compensation was too much on the higher side so i asked the lawyer how much is a mother worth he said that is a very unfair question of course it was it was meant to be unfair the year was 2009 I was due to retire in 2010. I turned to Justice Shiv Shivanyanam, my partner on the bench, and I told him, "I have only one year left. This is my opportunity to speak about the women's work at home." The Supreme Court may not agree because this ground was not raised. That they will ask, "Was this ground raised?" If this ground was not raised, the High Court had no business to go into that area. That's quite possible. so we said the monetary quantification of the work done by the women at home is something that is not really assessed the seed or deals with the measurement and quantification of the unremunerated domestic activities of women and the lack of recognition in the gross national product women's work is recognized 
no sorry the most of the women unpaid work around the world is performed by women unpaid care work is the foundation of human experience the care work that is done by a woman as a mother cannot be economically quantified and we who are brought up on a diet of mother india we will say no no i am doing it out of sacrifice no money value but the this the time had come to quantify how much it is because this child had lost the mother so we evolved different methods one is the opportunity cost which evaluates her wages by assessing what she would have earned had she not remained at home the second is the partnership method which assumes that a marriage is an equal economic partnership and the homemaker's value salary is valued at half the husband's salary then there is one which is called the replacement method how much would she be would she be paid if each of the duty performed by her is evaluated like teacher nurse how much will you be give and how do you quantify it the rulings of the cedo with regard to complaints made to it reveal the high prevalence of stereotypical attitudes with regard to the role of women one cannot also ignore or forget that the homemaker by applying herself to the tasks at home liberates her spouse to devote his energy and time and attention to tasks that augment his income so we said that this time had come to scientifically assess the value both in accident claims and and in maintenance issues as well but in our adversarial system that is the system we follow in india there there will be a case and a counter case in this case we did not have a precedent nor was the case argued and the minors lawyer deepika's lawyer did not argue this point at all so the, with that trepidation we gave the judgment but it turned out to be unnecessary because soon thereafter a case came up from uttar pradesh where a similar situation arose and uh, justice gonguli who was one of the judges said the time has come for the parliament to have a rethinking for properly assessing the value of homemakers and householders work and for giving compensation when the victim is a woman and a homemaker so the deepika principle deepika was the minor who lost both her parents is now the law because once one supreme court says that this is how it should be calculated even if the statutes are not amended accordingly until the statutes are amended the supreme court's dictat rules now courts follow it whether they cite deepika or not i am not done with this case yet recently dr rajeshwari sundar rajan wrote about this in in a magazine in granta she said a pro woman judgment is not necessarily a feminist judgment a feminist judgment displays knowledge of the difference that judge, that gender makes in social functioning and the consequent specific specificity of women's lives and experience it is informed as well by an overriding commitment to establishing gender justice the judgment in deepika is feminist because it translates women's gender assigned household work into legally mandated monetary terms of value sometimes though you are an agent of change the change may not happen but if the time is ripe it becomes institutionalized giving a monetary value enhances the worth of the work women cook at home with no one singing hosannas to what she does men cook as chefs and and they get michelin rouge and all other kinds of ribbon for for what they do only very recently women have entered that bastion so as abba sang it is money 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 and we had better give the value money value to the work done 
not in all situations but in situations where the where the woman is lost or the woman cannot work anymore or the woman is separated by divorce so that she gets what she is worth she is probably worth more but we have to have some parameter this i thought i would compare to a parachute jump you thought you would fall but somehow the wind blew you up high i really did not expect the supreme court would so soon confirm the judgment that was uh, fortuitous the last one is the novartis case this is very important because it also deals with access to health for the poor and therefore an aspect of the social order that i spoke about discussion about intellectual property rights is now increasing in its volume there are two novartis cases the one novartis case that came recently decided by the supreme court was whether that particular drug glivec deserved a patent or not the earlier novartis case which came before the madras high court where i was part of the bench was one which challenged the section 3d which we brought in after we became party to the trips agreement originally india um did not grant no i am wrong i mean originally india granted patents to products and processes then came what is called the justice rajagopal ayengar report it's an amazing document he this document he prepares before trips and you can still draw inspiration even after trips and the so many changes that have come he said that patents of chemical inventions should be restricted only to processes and not to products till the early 1970s india was dependent on imports for many essential bulk drugs and mncs dominated the scene drug prices were high the development of the bulk drug sector was actually the most important achievement of the pharmaceutical industry in india this came when the change was made that products will not be granted patent only processes india was in fact called the pharmacy of the world but when trips came we had to grant patents even to products but trips also said use the flexibilities in the agreement to suit your country and that is the way we enacted section 3d it was a moment of alarm other countries were looking to us they were apprehensive what we will do with our patent act whether we will amend it in such a way that uh their source of inexpensive drugs would would be dried up in the novartis case that the supreme court uh, wrote the the judges extract uh, two letters written to uh, by uh, who and un aids to our, our union minister of health and union of minister of industry and commerce that india should be very cautious while amending her uh, act to fall in line with the trips 3d says that a mere discovery of a known substance the known sub known substance could be esters ethers anything forms of something known which does not result in enhancing the efficacy would not be granted a patent now we had to decide whether 3d was constitutional we held it was constitutional 
But at the same time, we had to consider what this efficacy meant. There was parliamentary debates which showed the widespread fear in the mind of the members of the House that the common man would be denied access to life-saving drugs. They did not discuss for too long, but amazingly, they all thought alike, cutting across what we call party lines. Everybody was afraid. What did efficacy mean? We said, though the section is not confined only to drugs, as it deals with machines and apparatus as well, the explanation was definitely referable to the pharmacological fields. So then we went to the medical dictionary for efficacy, and then we said efficacy meant only therapeutic efficacy. That drug should work as it, it should be significantly better in its therapeutic efficacy. Therefore, incremental inventions, which were not significantly more effective in treating the disease therapeutically, will not be blessed with a patent. This construction accords with the object behind the TRIPS flexibilities, which allowed member states to adopt measures that are in the interest of public health and good, so long as they do not go against TRIPS. The recent Supreme Court judgment did not disturb our reasoning. But just imagine, if we had not pegged the efficacy to therapeutic efficacy, even increased solubility will be called efficacy. We would have faced what is known as evergreening. That is, a patent would be lengthened forever, the term of the patent, by little tweaks and incremental changes. I am unable to find a comparison for this IP judgment because IP is very unpredictable. It kicks in where you least expect it. You, you probably would have seen that there are other issues on which, too, there are change in the line of thinking of the Supreme Court, one being euthanasia and uh, So the, the, the evolution and, and uh, when it came to um, attempt to commit suicide being criminalized, there was a judgment which said uh, the right to live includes the right to die. So I, I can decide and it cannot be criminalized. And though the law commission made several recommendations that it is already a distressed person who moves towards suicide and don't punish him for it. There came another judgment which said, no, no, the right to die is not included. There may come a time soon when this will change. And the, the way judges are appointed, that is undergoing change. So without change, the institution will not be an institution which, as I said, which is alive. And I come to the end and just list those factors which mean good leadership, which promote good change. Leadership qualities cannot be institutionalized. And sadly, I'm sure you all know this, well-meant changes fade away when the incumbency changes. Uh, very, I, I don't know if this is true of all countries, but India is so incumbency based and the strength of the institution is very often not there. But it doesn't matter. We must pick up the gauntlet and make the change. Sometimes the declaration, declaration of the change cannot be explicitly made but if you believe it promotes the common good, the larger good, you just slide the change in with the silences. Steps backward are inevitable, but they cannot be a deterrent. Some changes outlive their use, and then we must fairly acknowledge, yes, it has outlived its use, and we must set it right. The long-term consequence must be visualized, and we must take the steps towards it. 
I enjoyed my years as a judge. As a lawyer, I could cry hoarse about the Constitution, but I was never sure it fell on receptive soil. But as a judge, I could be the agent of change. Finally, the words acting without fear or favor, affection or ill will, and upholding the law are not passwords only for judges, but anyone who wants to be a lead leader. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. I am told um, she has to catch a flight. So we'll try and make the questions brief. So those of you who want to ask questions, please put up your, um, I mean, this uh, nameplate. And we will try and also see if we can uh, uh, get the questions together and then she could respond. So maybe we could have one round of questions starting from here, this side. Uh, good evening, ma'am. I'm Commodore Das from the Navy. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you for a very uh, educative talk. Uh, ma'am, I do believe that the justice system in the, in the country is a very key pillar. And while its task is also to punish a criminal act, I do feel that it also has a role in deterring future criminal acts or uh, wrongdoing. There are many countries in the world modern countries too that have adopted rather barbaric punishments like flogging or you know whipping in public we may laugh at it from here saying what a funny punishment but it has a very strong deterrent appeal to the rest of the public that you know don't do this otherwise this will be the punishment do you think a time has come in india where for some issues to curb those issues with a uh, with a, with, a uh, with some strength we may have to adopt some such uh, penalties so that they're not repeated and you know we can focus on other issues do you think a time has come ma'am no it's on um no i do not agree i'll tell you why um i have heard i think i must have heard at least 140 life appeals uh, as a judge and uh, I do not remember or perhaps there was one or two out of them uh, which were not uh, where the appellants were not amongst the deprived and poorest people see, most of the time, if I looked at who the appellant is, it will be coolie, land, uh, daily worker. I refuse to believe that crimes are committed in India only by the poor. So there is something really wrong in the way our criminal justice delivery system, which also includes the police, works. It's not skewed fairly. And therefore, if we were to flog, we'll only be flogging the poor. And that I do not think is right. And I do not believe that deterrent has ever worked. If anybody else has any view, you may add. I mean, it's not, I mean, there is no such thing as I am alone right. I read something. In, in a book by Mark Tully. Of course, as a judge, I could not say that, but now I can say it. I think I am right, but I may be wrong. I think you are wrong, but you may be right. That humility, I think we have to have. So this is what I believe. It's so skewed. And uh, for this, uh, there are various, various reasons. Uh, they, they do not have access to the best legal help starting from that and our investigation mechanism is is not really excellent and if you are going to make scapegoats of the poor and punish them more i do not think we'll be moving towards the social order that i spoke of yes please yeah please go ahead uh, ma'am 
we used to hear very often that uh, justice delayed is almost as bad as justice denied. Uh, but in India, there are cases which carry on for generations. You know, is there a solution to that? See, recently the we are coming out with the commercial courts uh, ordin act where we believe that if costs are imposed on the persons who are responsible for the delay. It might work. I'll explain. See, there are there are certain categories of litigant which benefit by delay. Like for instance, borrowers, tenants. For them, you can you if you protract the matter sufficiently, and after 20 years, the tenant might say, I'm willing to come to a compromise, I'll vacate but he has bought the time. Borrower also does that. So, um, contrary to the misconception that it is judges alone who are responsible for delay, you must understand that there is the litigant, the lawyer and the judge. All the three play a part in the, uh, in the movement of the case. And I, I am not for a moment saying the judges are blameless. I am saying the system as it is now is, uh, has a propensity to encourage delay. And uh, I don't know how do you, how do you reform the, the mental discipline of a people? Even even if, let us say, commercial cases, the, the reforms come and immediately all lawyers jump up and immediately do the case and all judges immediately deliver judgments. There are other cases too, other categories of cases too, which are equally, equally important. There are many under trials who are staying in prison, probably for longer than the maximum punishment of the offence they had allegedly done. So, yes, I agree that this is a great injustice and it is something that all the people who are responsible, who are stakeholders, must make an earnest effort. It, it, it does not depend on just one or two. Um, it, 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 I, I totally agree with you. Let us, I mean, we, we just have to see how it will improve. Is there no constitutional remedy to this? What can the constitution do? I mean, some kind of... A see, see, long ago, uh, the, the Supreme Court gave a judgment which is called the Salem Bar Association case, where the Supreme Court said that if somebody asks for an adjournment, you see, this adjournment will be granted on, on payment of whatever sum cost. But to my knowledge, till now, no judge has done that. This has never been done. So, mm, the highest court has said that you have to impose cost. That deterrent, you spoke of here, that deterrent, if strictly imposed by every court, I think will work. Yes, yeah. Mr. Um, one question. Uh, why the interpretations from uh, uh, lower court, high court, and then Supreme Court. Interpretation of the law mm. gets changed from lower court to high court, high court to Supreme Court. In many cases, we see lower, lower court gives one judgment, then the petitioner goes to high court. The same judgment gets just 180 degrees reversed, and then when the again petitioner goes to Supreme Court, again the judgment gets uh, once again reversed. reversed. Yes. See, I, it, it's not quite the interpretation of law alone. It's the appreciation of the evidence also. And uh, you see, there may be uh, uh, some plea which one of the parties has made, which was totally overlooked by the first court. And so the high court says that this is wrong, this was not. Uh, and 
even with regard to appreciation of evidence, there may be some very important aspect or the, the one witness's evidence may have been. So it's not, um, when you use the word law, you're using it in a loose sense. It is evidence, it is the basic facts, and sometimes um, See, when we read the, the section again and again, we may get an insight into it which perhaps the, the lower court did not. I mean, it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not vagaries of human nature, but it's the perspective from which they see. That is why um, you often find uh, judges labeled as, these are workmen judges, these are management judges. Because, see, we are not like water, uh, tasteless, colorless. We come with some, some, be, uh, there are, I mean, I am, I am a product of, of my life. I believe that in spite of that, I should make a constant endeavor to remove those mental baggages and stereotypical notions that I have and go towards the truth. There, there may be some aberrations. Yes, Dr. Shubha. Uh, Ma'am, thank you for that excellent lecture. You know, you talked about some of the cases over the years, comparing with 70s and uh, uh, now. Uh, how would you, uh, as a former judge, or how, how is the current judiciary see the public faith in the institution? On a comparative note, from 1970s to now, uh, you know, maybe as a public, I may have a different opinion. How does the judiciary see that there are more people having faith in the system, or is that faith started diminishing? Uh, and is there a kind of a sen is, is is the judiciary sensitive to this? Because at least I am concerned. There was a time we all believed it. There was a, the, at least the percentage of people who believed in judiciary as the final. No, we have that in a democratic, liberal. We need that. I don't know whether uh, I'm that confident today on a comparative basis. I'm worried what would happen 20 years from now. I see the examples of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh around me, where the faith in the public institutions, including the judiciary, when it goes down, and you have to look at the alternative systems of uh, justice, which is, which is, you know, you look at the neighborhood, it's, it's, it's frightening. Uh, you know, forget about how we see how do you see? See, I'll say this. Um, some, I think, 40 years ago or some, something like that, Mr. Sirvai is supposed to have said that it is so terrible the condition. Our standards have fallen. Now, we refer to his times as very glorious times and we have fallen. See, there is a possibility that there is a fall in standards. I'm not saying no. But we also have a tendency to look at the past with some rose-tinted spectacles. That is also there. But uh, coming to your uh, question of how do the public see, uh, the most humbling truth is, in spite of the bad press the judiciary receives, I think the public still believe that without this, we won't work. I think that every judge has to internalize really deeply. I really believe that because I remember once, um, I used to go um, travel all over the country to various states, uh, training uh, magistrates and sub-judges in gender sensitivity. And there was one woman who came. Uh, she was uh, she was a victim of uh, marital abuse, and the husband had poured acid down her throat. So when she came to give evidence, she when she came to us, her throat was fairly normal. But when she went to give evidence, when it had corroded the cords, her voice came out as. A, croak and it in a court there are other persons right 
So they laughed. I don't think they meant to laugh at her, but sometimes you instinctively laugh, like when somebody slips on a banana skin. The sad thing is the judge laughed. Even the judge, I'm willing to give the judge the benefit of doubt, the judge probably did not mean to laugh at her. But she said, if he laughed, ye insaf kaha milega? So that is where they pick judiciary, in spite of everything. That's what, that's what I think. And it is, it, is, it is really imperative that the judiciary lives up to that, that hope. It is imperative. I don't think the judiciary can fail the people. Yes. Please go ahead. Then I think we'll move this side. Um, one question I have is our justice system uh, deals with very complicated uh, technical uh, issues at times. You know, recently we hear about uh, judgment on diesel cars, for example. I want to know how much of technicalities are brought into while judging such key technical areas. Um, the judges um, can ask for experts to come and give evidence because no judge can be a master of every discipline. In Novartis' case, the Supreme Court asked a professor to come and uh, assist in understanding what that molecular structure was about and everything. So I think there is nothing wrong with judges taking the assistance of experts in that field and trying to learn what the truth could be. I think we we should do it, especially now. I mean, there are there is such advancement in science which the church is probably incapable of understanding. And I still feel that the judicial temperament is very valuable in the decision making process. But since you need this expertise, I think we should seek the guidance of an expert. No, it's not done very regularly. It's not done regularly, but it should be done. Yeah, yes. please go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. I have two questions, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned firstly about Article 38, that this is the conscious of the government which the uh, judiciary make sure that they uh, take care of that. And it is also meant for the welfare of the people. What I'm referring to is the reservations in the country. It was started, it was uh, put in the constitution by the uh, Dr. Ambedkar and it was to have a currency of about 10 years. We are close to 70 years now since the um, attaining independence. Don't you think now since the government, no government has the guts to actually make any changes as far as this is concerned and this has grown, gone on growing from some percentage to where it is now close to 52 percent and it is not even being implemented the way it had been conceived. Don't you think it's time for the judiciary to now step in and uh, take it to a logical conclusion by um, firstly if it has to be amended to make it deserving to, to, uh, to get it to the people who are actually deserving rather than just as a um, rule for anybody who uh, belongs to these classes will get it. So I, I think it's high time that the judiciary now makes use of this Article 38 to ensure that this um, is now straightened out. And my second question pertains to something which is very uh, popular these days is the trial by media. Even before the case actually, uh, the moment it comes up in the uh, media, there is trial in all the channels and the decisions are given by them. How much does this influence the judgments which are finally given? I'm referring particularly to the Nirbhaya case which happened where a juvenile who was just a few months short of becoming an adult and he was ultimately, uh, he was let off uh, because of the fact that he was a juvenile and also the Salman Khan case. You know, these are some, some of the cases which have, uh, which have been pre-decided by the media. How much does that influence the uh, judges, ma'am. 
I'll answer the second question first. See, it's it's unavoidable, and it's a phenomenon that 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 is prevalent all over the world. Uh, when that O.J. Simpson trial was going on, uh, you could not open any TV without seeing O.J.'s face or somebody else's face. So that's there. Uh, judges can't insulate themselves. They they cannot lock themselves in an ivory tower, but I think they should have the discipline to to see the truth in spite of what the... But having said that, can you deny that in some cases where there has been a miscarriage of justice, it is the media which has prodded the system towards justice. So anything has its good and the bad. And so the judge who holds the balance should hold the balance right. That is the first, second question. The first question, I think your answer was in your question. That social order, we have not reached there yet. Yes? Uh, if we had reached, I don't think anybody would want to be, to be called a reservation person. And for the court to do it, see, you have a view about this. So if a court steps in and says, from tomorrow no more reservation, you'll think it's a fantastic idea. But courts are not there to decide policy. You also talk of activist court. It's just outstepping its limit. It's just uh, emasculating the other two pillars. So what do we do? So, this, it is possible that they thought that uh, a problem would be solved in 25 years, but it has not been solved. I'm sure there are any number of engineers and architects who think a building will come up in two years, it does not come up in two years. So we can't punish them, nor can we stop it at that second year. So we are, we are moving towards a social architecture where everybody feels he or she is equal. And we move towards that. Yes, please go ahead. You please. <coughs> Madam, what does the Constitution say? Huh? What does the Constitution say about, uh, say, matter of tradition? Why I'm asking is uh, the, the issue of Jalikattu in Tamil Nadu. Mm. There is one side, the animal lovers. Other, other side is a tradition. Mm. So, matters of such issues, how the constitution treats? They go by tradition or they go by law? The constitution does not talk about tradition. The constitution talks about what it talks about. Then it is the judge which who has to weigh the two and see if, if see for instance, I'll, I'll, I'll choose a very ex extreme example. I mean, you must not say this lady is so irrational, okay? Sati was a tradition. But it goes against our constitution. So it's for judges to, to keep the balance in mind. Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Our constitution, I think, was based on primarily the UK's constitution. Theirs was unwritten, ours was written. Pardon me? The constitution, our no. constitution, if I understand right, was no. based on UK's constitution. No, no, maybe. To a large extent. Irish. No. Irish. Irish, USA. It borrowed from, from okay. many, many constitutions. And uh, we evolved. What? Our system, our judicial system, mm. and the US system where they have a jury. Mm. How would you compare the two pros and cons and... Uh, See, we had jury until the Nanavati case. I don't remember which year. Sir, when they were shown Nanavati? Not so, not 72 earlier. Huh? So, so we, we had jury and then we, we abolished it. I don't, I am not sure jury will work here. I have my doubts. I have my doubts uh, about uh, the jury system. 
But what I think is, see, um, we follow the common law. The common law is this man says that, that man says this, and this judge says which is right and which is wrong, almost like, I mean, in some ways you can call a neutral umpire, not quite neutral, but whereas uh, the European countries follow the civil inquisitorial system where the judge takes an initiative. I think maybe we should evolve a hybrid system, but I don't know. This is just my personal feeling. It has nothing to... Because the... We... I, very often I feel that uh, there is a whole lot of unheard voices in the courtroom. And just to hear these two voices and decide, I, I don't know. It may be legal, but is it justice is something that, that I wonder. It's a really weird question, but is crowdsourcing a good <coughs> way of getting opinions on legal matters. Then outs outsourcing? Crow crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing, okay. No, that will make it too diffuse. Mob justice. Uh, mob justice. Yeah, next please, yeah. A very quick question on the uh, case of the homemakers uh, pay assessment. What would your judgment have, have been if she was working and she died? Would she then be assessed mm. for her work at home alone? Uh, sorry, work at outside home or would it take into account both? No, no. If she worked outside, then it is very easy for the court. The co what it does is it takes that pay and calculates a number. It's, it's all... It's all a tabular column. It's really heartbreaking because mother has gone and father has gone and we are looking at tabular columns. And then there is even one, one fixed amount for loss of love and affection, for heaven's sake. How do you value loss of love and affection? But that's what we do mean. Uh, how much is the husband worth to a wife or the wife worth to a husband? How do you evaluate? No, that we don't do. So we, we have to make do with some kind of a... Uh, structure. So if she was working, if Deepika's mother had been working, there's no issue at all. Her pay would have been taken and she would have been given something. But why not the value of her work at also? No, how we do it is, it's, it's called, um, there's a word for it, non-working non member or something like that. And some nominal amount is given to such persons. And I felt that it was time to change it. But, but I must say, um, after the judgment came, many of my male colleagues came to me and said, we also thought like that, why didn't we say it? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something I have to say to be balanced to the men in the room. One last question. Um, frankly, everything is lopsided against the women. One is a little more, one is a little less, but it's that. So, I don't think any group need be very happy that they have achieved equality. Huh? Why, we Why we are not achieved is uh, a issue. no. Uh, religion is man-made, and he makes sure he gets the property. We don't have any more judges like Mr. Sri. No, it's really religion is always a male structure. It, 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 it's, I'm not blaming anybody. Historically, that's how it has been. So wherever you see, the taboos will be against the woman, in whichever religion. But the goddesses are all women. 
God, that is, you know, that is something we are stuck with. And they say, we are, you are goddess and then there will be one Nirbhaya. So, I don't know what this goddess means. I'd rather not be a goddess and treat it with dignity and respect. No, he's just, I know, I know Mr. Karthikeyan, he has the greatest respect, he's just pulling my leg. <laughs> you have no choice but to be a goddess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can't uh, abdicate that position. Mm -hmm. Yes. Temple. <laughs> the matter is in the court. Subcutis yeah, matter is in the court. <laughs> I don't know. It's a, it's it's a quite a difficult question. Not because of the See, there are, there are so many taboos and Lakshman Rekhas that have been broken with no ill effect. But uh, this, I understand, is a very, very um, emotional and sensitive issue. And I really feel sorry for the judges who have to decide it because it, it's 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 a thankless job media uh, says most of the women don't want it media says yeah see it is like it is like um, uh, and, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I don't, I don't know the, I don't know the what, whether the media says it's true. It is possible. It is possible that uh, mm, the women may feel that some evil may befall them. I do. I really don't know because these are all very difficult. I was really amused to see on my way from the airport big posters saying, "We are totally vasto coordinated <laughs> in this day and age." So, when do we develop scientific temper? I think it's all mixed there. Matters of faith also. Matters of faith also, yeah. But uh, I think that Vastu was, was, was applicable when, not when, we, when you have Empire State Buildings. So, even that should change with the times. Yeah, I think she says I should stop. Yes, I should stop now. Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Asit Das to give a vote of thanks. It's my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks to Justice Sri Devan. I feel very fortunate to be in this gathering that I could hear when you started your lecture, I was thinking that what would we know being technical people, uh, what kind of coverage would you have and how relevant it would be to our, to our work and life that we do. I'm sure all of you will agree that, that what Justice Sridevanji told us today can't be more explicit and more clear. At least to me, I rediscovered these two words, the continuity and change and brought together in such a nice way with so many live examples of your uh, previous life and work on, on the cases that you have handled, that if there is no change, the continuity is just a stagnation. And if the change is so big that the continuity is under question, 
then it could be a tyranny of change. I have got this message out of all the cases that you described before us. It is told that our Supreme Court is the strongest court in the world. We know it for sure that when nothing works, we have the court system, we have the justice system that makes it work. That is why it is so powerful today. That is why the image of our justice system to the common public is still so, so much hope and expectation is there that at the end our justice will be delivered. With these few words, I would like to thank on behalf of the organizers here, Nias, uh, who have really uh, been so greatly organizing this platform and bringing in such eminent persons amongst, amongst us so that we could hear from you. I think uh, I would request all of you to give a standing ovation. Thank you.